more. Um, I'm from the CUNY Graduate Center and um, I'm presenting some of my thesis research um, and I'm using David Bowie as a case study of the intersections of fandom, celebrity death, and tourism. Mm -hmm. So as you may know, uh, David Bowie, musician, actor, and international icon, uh, died January 10th, 2016 of a secret battle he was having with liver cancer. And his death came as a shock to his fans because uh, just two days prior was his 69th birthday and the release of his final album, Black Star. So the day after his death is when the world found out that he had died. And approximately 4.3 million tweets were posted in the first 24 hours, um, eulogizing and celebrating him. And this is per the Daily Mail. One tweet in particular, which you can see here, um, suggested meeting up in Brixton, his hometown in South London, to have a party in front of the Ritzy. The Ritzy is a cinema down there that's very old, very popular, very cool. And this tweet was seen by a few other fans, but somehow it got picked up by the enemy and the independent. So pretty major like entertainment news outlets. And because it was picked up by that, another fan decided, well, I'm gonna make a Facebook event about this. And as you can see, quite a few people were interested. And that further spread the word. And then it didn't seem to matter anymore whose idea this was. What mattered was getting as many people as possible to come down to his hometown in Brixton on short notice that night and just party. And this is an example of how social media can lead to support through action and how you can like meet up at these real world quote unquote events and connect with your community and just be like, yes, we're all like-minded people. We all feel the same things. So I gotta tell you a little bit about Brixton. So I've got a map for you. Um, so here we are, we're in Brixton. It's January 11th, 2016. And we need to understand what's happening here. So when you enter Brixton, you're coming in on the tube station. The underground station's right here. Brixton Road and Tunstall Road. Down here is where the Ritzy Cinema is, and this is a huge public open square named Windrush Square after the first immigrants that came to the UK after World War II to work, and they primarily settled in this area of South London. So to say, hey, thanks for coming here when all of our people were dead and we need the people to work, they named this area after them. And then up here, we have Stansfield Road, which is where David Bowie was born in 1947. So keeping all that in mind, this is all within about a 10, 15 minute walk from each other. It's very close by, super accessible. It's all flat ground, there's tons of buses, there's the underground tube station, there's the overground tube station. People with disabilities can get to this area quickly. Everything's a short walk or, you know, roll if you're in a wheelchair, so you can easily get from place to place. So while the proposed location was Windrush Square, down at the bottom, it was very easy to hop over to where the tube station is, because on Tunstall Road, right across the street, is this huge mural of David Bowie that had been painted in 2013. So luck had it, it was super easy to find this mural too. And then while I'm in the area, I might as well go to the place where he was born. And here's what it looked like. So, quoting Erica Doss, who's a professor of American studies, we can know that spontaneous memorials help us mediate the crisis of, the, of sudden inexplicable loss, and that these are highly scripted performances of mourning and maddening mad grief. So, we're trying to grapple with, with this feeling of loss, because we're so attached to these figures like David Bowie, that we just don't know what to do, so you just need to be with other people who understand what you're doing or what you're feeling. So in Wayra Square, it's estimated about a few thousand people were there. And the local government land of council said about 5,000 people over the course of the weekend after his death came to the mural here at the bottom. And you can see the tube station right behind it um, came to leave tributes or graffiti on the wall around the mural, which is kind of mind boggling. <laughs> Um, and they also left at the mural materiality, which you can see also at his house. Um, they left flowers, candles, cards, 
a stuffed pony, like typical things you would expect to see, maybe not so typical in some cases, but these are very scripted responses to grief. Like, I don't understand this loss, so now I'm gonna write you a letter that you will never see, but I need to get it out. It doesn't matter you won't see it, it just needs to come out. Here's another close-up of the shrine that was uh, collecting around the mural in particular. And this is, this whole night is the birth of this main event. And this persists to this day, that people are going to Brixton, they're going to this mural, they're graffitiing the wall, taking a photo, leaving their messages, and leaving flowers and whatever else I've seen guitars, I've seen unidentified liquids, I've seen really, like, not like urine, although I'm sure there's urine, but like, you know, I'm assuming like wine and beer and whiskey and things like that, and like really beautiful pieces of artwork, and it breaks my heart because these things eventually end up in the trash. As far as I'm aware, from speaking with people in the local government and stuff, they're not keeping them. So I don't know where people are collecting these and I'm like, oh, but some of them are so beautiful. So the only way that there's documentation is when local blogs take pictures, which they do. There's one called Brixton Buzz that takes fairly regular, regu fairly regularly documentation. Or if you, the fans, are showing up there and you happen to see something interesting and you take that picture and then you post it. Otherwise, no one else is seeing it, which is a shame. So due to this continued attention from fans, the local government had to get involved. So I visited the mural in Brixton for the first time in June 2016. By pure coincidence, the artist of the mural was there and he was touching up the paint. He had to do this because there was so much graffiti, people started writing over um, the space bubbles and actually David's face. So first they started just bringing in the artist every few months to say, hey guys, can we not write on the face? Because, you know, he's kind of a big deal and it's expensive. So then they kind of gave up. They decided to put in sectional sheets of plexiglass, which was kind of okay, but then you can slide all of your notes and random pizza flyers, it looks like, into, <laughs> into the Pepsi glass. So it's like, now it just kind of looks nasty. So finally, in uh, mid-2018, they installed this massive, very sturdily secure to the wall, plexiglass thing. So instead, now people are graffitiing on the glass. It's a whole other problem, but you know, it's okay. It's not gonna look as bad. And this, can, this uh, is affirming that this area is gonna be a landscape that pilgrims and fans are gonna come to for as long as, you know, there's an interest in David Bowie, which I'm sure it will be for a long time. And not only are they protecting this idea of Bowie and Brixton, like I write, they're also inadvertently protecting David Bowie fans in Brixton, which is pretty cool. So this brings us to the notion of participatory authorship. <clears throat> and because this mural and its archive through blogs and social media posts is not being documented in any way, we're getting this collective story being told through uh, the fans. They're literally writing it on the wall. And even though the plexiglass is only on a certain amount of the mural, the writing goes all over the wall. It goes way past where you would think it would go. There's um, bricks around the corner from it. Like, people are intense. And as you can see, they don't care if there's already no more wall. They're gonna write over somebody else's message to make sure their message can be there. And because of this, they're becoming authors of Bowie's memory rather than just a consumer of it. Which, again, I think is very cool. And it shows us the versatile ways that David Bowie is like, important to everybody else. Because what he means to you is not what he's gonna necessarily be to me. 
So every persona of Bowie can be featured on this wall as long as they want him to be there. And through that, he can be remembered in any particular way in Brixton. Again, as long as a fan wants him there. Because of that, fans are mediating his idea and his identity. So through this web 2.0 and e-word of mouth through social media, um, Bowie fans, the locals on their blogs, and global news outlets are telling us who David Bowie is and who David Bowie in Brixton is. And this consistent coverage is showing us that this is an important place. And every time there's a post, every time there's a, a new selfie, somebody's posting, not posting, but like, you know, it's featured on websites like this, the top things to do in Brixton. It's saying, this place is important. This place is important. Look at this place, look at this place. Don't look at where he lived in New York City for more than half of his life. Don't look at Berlin. Don't look anywhere else that David Bowie ever lived. Look at Brixton. And that just keeps getting repeated. And so if you're even a casual like observer of this, you're saying, I gotta go to Brixton. And it's gonna sit in the back of your mind. So if you happen to be in London and you're a Bowie fan, you're gonna be like, I got some time, I can go to Brixton. <laughs> but because of this, and it's so ingrained that the idea is going to this mural in particular, like this video um, that the culture trip made, it opens with this guy getting off the train, goes straight to the mural, looks at tributes and writes on the wall, mm -hmm. and then goes about his day. So it's saying the thing to do, let's go to that mural, you write your name, you remember Bowie. One of the best things I ever saw written there was I've never heard of you, but RIP fam. <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> I loved it. So previously, <laughs> it's so good. Previously, all of these uh, trips and pilgrimages that fans were taking to Brixton were folk events. It wasn't anything officially organized. It was just, hey, I like this. My friends and I like this. We're gonna go here. Nobody's profiting off of us. We're gonna do what we're gonna do. And that's it. But because this kept happening and happening and happening, um, commercial tours have propped up. And the main one is called Bowie Tour London, which was created in 2017. They advertise their Brixton tour because they now have one of Soho and Beckingham. Beckingham being where he lived as a teenager, where he started his career, and Soho being where he recorded a lot of his music, um, both also in like the greater London area. They advertise Brixton as an all-encompassing journey from birth to death. And here you can see some photos from when I took this tour in January. Everyone's very excited to be by his house. The, the people who live in the house do not want anything to do with it. <laughs> um, the tour guide, Mr. Nick Stevenson, um, brandishes a guitar. And as he takes you from location to location, he is singing covers of Bowie's song and encouraging sing-alongs, which felt very awkward when you're standing in front of people's houses on the sidewalk, but it was still cool. And then you have a great big fun group picture in front of the mural because why the hell go to Brixton if you're not going to get a picture in front of the mural? So it's pretty interesting that this is becoming a commercialized thing when Brixton naturally lends itself to this art. You can start with where he was born very easily in one afternoon, pop on down, oh, here's Brixton Academy, played here a few times. Here's a place where he donated some money for a cultural center. Here's another place he hung out. Here's another place. Oh, he died. We don't know where his ashes were buried. So we're gonna hang out where everyone else went the night he died, which is Windrush Square and the mural. And to borrow Jennifer Otter Bickerdite and John Sparrowhawk's words, by touring this area alone or with a guide, Fans are normalizing and rational, rationalizing the transformation of spaces from overlook to revered. So while these are otherwise normal areas, his home doesn't look like anything special. There's no heritage plaque. There's no interpretation of any sites. The Windrush Square has nothing there that says David Bowie. The mural, like, yeah, it's protected, but there's nothing there to tell you, like, why it's protected. It doesn't tell you why there's graffiti. There's no interpretation of it. So that's why, especially like fans are making this happen. 
bands are giving this place this, this meaning and making it important because otherwise it's just, all right, that's all right. Sure, let's go there, why not? So without this band, it becomes just another place to live. It only becomes important through them. And so, quote Jennifer Otter Bickerdike again, it allows the fan to follow Bowie, feel closer to him, if only for a few minutes, because it happened here. We also have commercial Brixton. So the mural is on the side of a department store, of course. <laughs> and in the wake of his death, because I have friends who live in the area, so they told me beforehand, it wasn't like this in the department store. Um, they have a, this huge section, and there's actually other Bowie items throughout the store, but this was just the main centralized location. They have mixed in all of this official and I think unofficial merch. They wouldn't talk to me about it. And um, I don't know if you can see, but these are mint tins. They have magnets, coffee mugs, they got tote bags over here with the mural picture printed on it. And it's like, well, who's getting the royalties? Is Bowie getting your money, Bowie's estate? Is the street artist who graffitied that getting the money? Or are you just keeping it? They won't tell me. There's also like fan art, as you can see, like postcards. But then you have his vinyl records for sale. So it's just very confusing as where this money's going. And it's because it's tied to like kitschy, like I went to London and like I went to Brixton tours and stuff. It's very clear like Brixton is now a Bowie destination. And like if you live in Brixton, you're not gonna buy a pillow that says Brixton. Like, you know, it's like I heart New York t-shirts, I live in New York, I don't need to buy that. <laughs> so it just it's a very questionable situation. And other shops in the area have also embraced Bowie. So a lot of them have put up Bowie posters or artwork in their shops. One, there's a coffee shop across the street from the mural called Brixton Blend. They have special Stardust Espresso that you can order. <laughs> um, there's even a UK hotel chain called Premier Inn. It's a two minute walk from the mural. In their lobby, they have a life-size reproduction of the mural. It's in the picture in front of it. The real thing is two minutes down the street. So it's, it's very much, look what we got here. And while this happened, this last thing is the Brixton Pound. This was in the process of being made before he died. However, it's, it's complicated. <laughs> so Brixton is a very unique little neighborhood and they have their own local currency. It's one to one with the, uh, the normal sterling pound. So 10 pounds Brixton pound, 10 pound sterling pounds. You can only use it in Brixton. So local shops will use it, but like Starbucks will also accept it. And it's a way to keep money within the community and it, they call it money that sticks to Brixton. So they have, every bill has um, a local hero, hometown love on it. And the, lo the locals vote on who gets to be on it. So before he died, Bowie actually approved. He said, yes, I'll be involved. He got the Duffy archive to clear the Aladdin Zane image. Very, very cool. He died very sad. Now this is a very sought after item. And they sell bulk items of $10 Bowie bills on their website and special prints of the $10 Bowie bill on their website, which like, it's a nonprofit organization that do a lot of good in the community. So it's like, Okay, that's cool, but also this is a very commercialized item. It's literally money that you can then go spend in Brixton only. So it's also, again, like, it's good, but also, what's going on? Um, and it's, this mediation at Brixton and Bowie would theoretically clash with the idea of it being a sacred site for fans, but to them, it seems from the outside that they're just super stoked, and it's like, yes, this is the ultimate place to be a Bowie because I can get all this stuff. So it's fun for them, they love it. And it's also interesting that despite all of these things for sale, um, the attention still is the mural. So 
So what is the aftermath? Bowie's fans are creating a new layer of meaning for Brixton. It's being embraced by the local government and businesses because it is good for business. They are making tons of money. And for a neighborhood that has been undergoing very drastic gentrification for years already, this is like, hell yeah. Come on, white people, it's safe here. And I'm not joking. Um, Bowie tourism signals safety because many white people are still scared to go to Brixton. In the 70s and 80s, um, there was a lot of police brutality cases against immigrants and people of color, which led to rioting and response because don't break into people's homes and shoot them. <laughs> like, what do you expect? But to everyone else, still today, I have taxi drivers who are afraid to drop me off in Bristol. And that's not okay. So it seems to me that they're just quietly embracing it. Yes, come to Bristol. David Bowie's a nice white guy. I've got lots of nice white guy merch for sale. <laughs> come give us your dollars. So again, complicated, questionable. Bowie mania sanitizes Brixton's occasionally troubled past, but also eclipses its vibrant history and culture. So like I said, after World War II, oh no, my time is up. After World War II, it was a, a huge influx of immigration coming to the area that they came here. That's a huge culture being erased by just focusing on David Bowie. And to end, like these three, separate things of Bowie and Brixton and Phantom have become so intertwined after his death and it's inseparable. And it's frustrating because now you can't pull them apart. The fandom is so much a part of the history and now Bowie is so much of the history that it doesn't matter if locals are happy or not. And from speaking to many of them, they're not happy. So it remains to be seen how severe this transformation will be. Thank you for listening.